Okay, so the last thing that I'm going to talk about before we have one more little session is bacterial genome sequencing. So this is whole genome sequencing. So beforehand I was talking about looking at a particular gene or set of genes or locations within the genome um, and making phylogenetic trees that way or trying to distinguish between different strains of a species. But you can actually do it on a whole genome level as well. So you take your bacterial culture, um, you extract the DNA, you sequence it, and then you do the bioinformatics part, which is basically assembling it. And so the way that the technology works at the moment for whole genome sequencing is that a bacterial genome will be millions of bases long, normally. So Staph aureus, for example, is three, about three million bases long. But unfortunately, we don't quite have the technology where we can just sequence one whole long strand of DNA that's 300, oh, 3 million bases long. So we actually get these fragments. So we chop the DNA up into small pieces multiple times. And we do it for multiple, uh, we <coughs> amplify the DNA. So we get lots of copies of the DNA. And we cut it multiple times in random places this time. And then we get these shorter reads. So initially when the technology started, it was about 36 bases. So you can imagine 36 bases as a percent of 3 million bases is really small in trying to do an assembly. But now we're getting about 250 bases with this type of technology. And so what you have to do in order to try and actually uh, figure out what the sequence is, is you take these small reads of DNA. So this is the parts that you've sequenced and you build it up like a jigsaw. So you can see there's all these pieces here and you layer them up based on their sequence identity. So it's like the multiple uh, sequence alignment that you saw before, but on a smaller scale. And you, you line them all up like this. And you do it against a reference genome. In this case, uh, it's very tricky if you don't have a reference genome. Um, so you find that some species are better studied than others. So E. Kylo, for example, there's loads of sequence strains, so it's easier to get a reference sequence. Other things that are less popular, you don't tend to get it, and it makes the uh, phylogenetics much more difficult. So what you have here is a sequence that's already been uh, sequenced. So you've got your reference genome, and you align these reads to it. So you want something that's quite closely related. If it's not closely related, nothing's going to map to it. And then what you're interested in is, again, variance. And so you get this. This is coverage. So the amount of reads that, or pieces of DNA that align over a particular base, the number is the depth of coverage. And so what, if you get a base here that's different to a base here, then you say it's a SNP, a single nucleotide polymorphism. So it's, it's um, a variant. And sometimes it can be quite tricky. So I don't know how clear it is here, but you've got A's and G's here and a G there. And so the way that you decide which base to call here is the one that, that's more frequent. So in this case, it would be hard to. So you say it's a heterozygous polymorphism. Um, and it would be really difficult to call that base. Sometimes people ignore that base. But you generally rely on the coverage. If you've got lots of coverage, you'll find that you'll get one base more than the other. So it could be something to do with a sequencing error or something like that, or a heterozygous polymorphism, in which case you can't really call what base that is. But once you've done this, then you get this alignment. So you get another piece of sequence that's a consensus of all of these small pieces of jigsaw. And then you can align. That's already aligned against the reference. So it's a much bigger scale of what you did before. And again, you can remove gaps or ignore gaps and that kind of thing.